Hello and welcome to the episode 177 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. The beginning of the composition of one of the Beatles' most beloved early singles, three different tour dates around the world, and a bit of studio work are on our menu for today's show. On the 26th of June 1961, the Beatles, featuring Pete Best on drums, performed their 87th straight night at a top 10 club in Hamburg, West Germany. Two years later, in 1963, the Beatles, now with their final lineup with Ringo Starr on drums, performed at the majestic ballroom in Newcastle upon Tyne, their last time at a top rank ballroom. The band will continue to be booked in the company's cinemas and theatres, but their manager Brian Epstein's no ballroom policy was enforced to guarantee the maximum security for the lads. Earlier in the evening, in their hotel room at the Turks Hotel, John Lennon and Paul McCartney started writing She Loves You, which was immediately considered for the Beatles' next single release. Paul McCartney explains the birth of the song both in the Beatles anthology book and in Barry Miles's Many Years From Now. At planned and answering song where a couple of us would sing She Loves You and the other one answers Yeah, yeah. We decided that that was a crummy idea as it was, but at least we then had the idea for a song called She Loves You. The song was completed the next day in Liverpool. In 1964, the Beatles flew from Auckland to Dunedin, New Zealand, to play the local town hall, two shows for a total of 8,000 people. More interesting than the concerts, though, the flight was an uneasy affair. Prior to the takeoff, someone called anonymously to claim that a germ bomb had been placed on a plane. Luckily, it was not true, but you can imagine it wasn't plain flying for whoever was on board. Not that the arrival was plain sailing either, thanks to the still inadequate presence of the police to restrain the excessive enthusiasm of the many fans. In escaping the mob to reach their hotel, John Lennon lost a handful of hair and Paul McCartney's face was scratched. What I can promise is that, although tempting, I will not ask you for your hair as a token of your fabness. I will ask you, instead, to head to www.simonmas.com support and check out what you can do to help me out to keep offering the best music-related content I can produce. I don't know if it's true, but according to recent scientific studies, becoming one of the top hatters that support me and help me grow might increase your sex appeal by some 80%. It's also painless and safe, and you will get more content to enjoy. What more to ask? Another tour in 1965. On the 26th of June, in the morning, the Beatles were driven by the Alfa Romeo racing team to Genoa, Italy, one Beatle per car. The afternoon gig at the city's Palazzetto dello Sport reached a further negative record in the attendance for this tour. Only 5,000 fans in a venue that could comfortably seat 25,000. It went a bit better at night, with 10,000 fans attending the 9.30 performance. Soon after the end of this gig, the band left on a chartered airplane to reach Rome. 1966. The Beatles arrived in Hamburg a little after 6 am to continue what turned out to be their last tour. It was the first time in the city after leaving on the 1st of January 1963, when the band had completed their Christmas residency at the Star Club. At the station and in the backstage of the 5,600-seat Ernst Merck Hall, the lads met a host of old familiar faces, including Astrid Kirchherr, who gave John letters written by his departed friend Stu Sutcliffe, and Bert Kampfert, who had produced the first-ever Beatles recording session as detailed in episode 173 of this podcast. The Fab Four performed two shows in the evening, with a press conference between the two sets. Then, 
while a riot erupted inside and outside the hall after the second show, John Lennon and Paul McCartney managed to break away and have a night walk down the Reaper Band, away from the fans and the Beatles' entourage, visiting old places and meeting old friends. Moving on to 1967, we get the Beatles returning to the EMI Studios this afternoon for a 4 to 8 pm session after the recording of the bulk of All You Need Is Love live on satellite TV the previous day. The first business at hand was recording a drum roll that introduced the piece. Then, the final mono mixing of the song was completed. All You Need Is Love was to be released as a single, Pronto, with Baby You're a Rich Man on its B-side. More studio work on the 26th of June 1968. Once again, George Harrison busied himself with the production of Jackie Lomax's first single for Apple, Sour Milk Sea, with Paul McCartney playing a bass part for the song in Abbey Road. In the end, the song featured Lomax, George Harrison, Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, Eric Clapton on guitar and Nicky Hopkins on piano. Later on, the Beatles were finally together in Studio 2 at the EMI Studios to work on another John Lennon song that would become Everybody's Got Something to Hide Except Me and My Monkey. From the beginning of the work for the new album, the band had started recording the rehearsals of the various songs, choosing the best one as take one and working on it over dubbing various parts. A number of takes for the still untitled song were recorded in this fashion between 7 pm and 3.30 am, but in the end, none was deemed usable. This concludes another episode of this podcast. For another piece of history of the four you love, you'd better tune in tomorrow for another What A Fab Day entry. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love.